Welcome back this morning, gentlemen. We're going to get rolling with our morning Bible study. Bernie Bresson from Ohio is going to be leading us in that, and he can uh, share with you the instructions from here. So, Bernie, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Good morning. 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 Why don't we all stand and have an opening prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful morning. Thank you for this opportunity to meet with other LMM men from across the country. Lord, we just ask that you be with us today as we go through this training and that uh, open the hearts and minds of uh, these participants, that they uh, get some valuable information out of our uh, session today to take back to their uh, local churches and, uh, and their synods. We ask this in your holy name. Amen. If you look on the table, you'll see I passed out sheets uh, that has the the Bible study we're going to use. I'll tell you, I'm as much of a novice about doing Bible studies as you'll find. Uh, I don't uh, claim to be that knowledgeable about the Bible, but as you look in the Bible, you on the page here, you see the scripture we're going to do. It's... Uh, Mark 10, 17 to 31. And below and the one beside, you see all the questions. And if you remember last night, Doug talked about 20,000 uh, questions in the Bible. You need more of those? There's some up here, yes. I'll wait till everybody... Uh, Get some. Hopefully, everybody slept well and got a good breakfast this morning. Okay. Um, like I said, you see all the questions, even the, the answers on some of them are there for you. So it's, it's pretty self-explanatory and an easy Bible study for the, for the novice to, to go through with the discussion uh, questions and things. Uh, I'm going to read through the scripture, and then uh, we're going to break up into groups of, uh, what do you want, four? Or just wherever we are at the tables that you're at, and uh, you can go through and... Uh, We'll answer the questions, and then we'll get back together and have some a little bit of discussion. So, As I read over this a number of times this past week, the rich young man, and I got thinking about it when Jesus told him to be, uh, you know, you have to give up everything you have to uh, get eternal life, and I thought, wow, you know, everything you have. It's kind of scary, you think. You know, you've worked hard for the things you have, and then just... Here you have uh, Jesus telling you, you have to give it up. But you have to go through the scripture and, and listen to what he has to say about that, and then you realize that you're not really giving anything up. In the end, you'll have more. Anyway, as it starts out, as Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered, No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not give false testimony. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, All these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said. Go sell everything you have and give to the poor. And you will have treasures in heaven. Then come, follow me. I don't know. What do you think about that? At this time, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard is it for the rich man to enter the kingdom of God? The disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said again, Children, How hard is it? 
to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through an eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were even more amazed and said to each other, Who then can be saved? Drink the cup I drink, or be baptized with... Wait a minute, did I turn the wrong page? Yes, I did. Nope. Drink the cup I drink, or be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with. I am reading the wrong page. Excuse me. Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible, not with, but not with God. All things are possible with God. Peter said to him, We have left everything to follow you. I tell you the truth, Jesus replied. No one who has left home, or brothers or sisters, or mother or father, or children or fields for me in the gospel will fall to receive a hundred times and will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age homes brothers sisters mothers children and fields and with them persecutions and in the age to come eternal life but many who are first will be last and the last first like i said that's uh I think somebody, if you asked them a question how to do that and they told you just, you know, hand over everything you had, you'd probably be a little uh, um, defensive, maybe, and go uh, like, you know, what are you talking about? You know, I worked hard for this stuff. So what I want you to do is go through, I'm going to, well, I will read this one little icebreaker question for everybody and then we'll... uh, We'll go on to the, and most of the questions I went to the deal with are the ones on the column on the side, not not the ones at the bottom that are kind of like multiple choice. But <clears throat> if your house were on fire, what three items did you try to save? That's, uh, you know, I, I, I read that one and I was thinking the one morning I was doing this, what would be the three items I'd try to save? So, um. Richard. If I had to, uh, I would, the first thing I'd want to save was get people out, number one. Okay. Somebody in the middle. And remember that wealth not, does not pertain just to money. It's not just money, it's everything. When you have the wealth, then it just means everything. Okay. Anybody else have any thought on that? What would be three items that you would uh, try to get out? My wife, my pictures, and my Bible. Okay. Ed. Yeah, photo albums, legal documents, and a rental car. Ken. He did. I could testify to that. And he jumped off his roof to get to the ground. My wife, my pictures, and my Bible. Wife, pictures, and his Bible. Well, okay, at this time, then, let's uh, take the questions that's uh, in front of you and uh, go through them, and then we'll come back together and uh, talk about them a little bit. You can see by using the Master Builder Bible where there's questions there that are already in front of you that you can work off of makes it a lot easier to, to do a Bible study on your own and in your small group than if uh, you just picked up one of the other Bibles that's out there that doesn't have those questions. I know it's it's helped me considerably and it, it sure gives you a lot of things to think about. So hopefully uh, you can take it back and, and uh, put it to uh, use in your own congregations or your groups. But one thing I'm going to ask you before we leave uh, in the box on the bottom, there's a question, a number seven. I want you to think about this. Name one thing you can do this week to let go of material things and embrace God's kingdom more fully. So as you go about this weekend, 
think about that question and uh, and see if you can come up with uh, an answer or, or something uh, related to that question this week. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Just don't think about it. Do it. Right. Well, gentlemen, we're going to move forward in our agenda this morning. The next uh, group of topics we've titled LMM Retreats, Resources, and Workshops. Uh, we're going to have a variety of speakers sh sharing some of their experiences about each of these. And for, um, most of the uh, items are in your workshop, in your handbook. Some are not, but that's all right. And um, just going to first off invite Steve Brown. Steve Brown's from Nebraska, and he's been uh, helping a lot with Lutheran Mission, the One Year to Live. Currently, Steve and I are co leading our national One Year to Live retreat, treat, te retreat team, team made up of two two guys from each retreat from across the country and we, we have a great relationship with those guys on monthly conference calls and help create materials and also keep each other motivated and, uh, and uh, spiritually blessed by being with each other. Steve? It's a good job. Turn over to you, brother. You too, bud. Here's, uh, you want the clicker on this? So. Oh, I, f I think I'll figure it out. Yeah, there you go. Well, guys, I, I've got to say, oh. yeah. That's right, I gotta stay here. I'm a walker, so I'm gonna have to do some walking here. You know, I gotta talk with my hands too, Jim. You know that you know that about me, right? I know. I'll throw the clicker. I, I guess guys, I just feel that when I when I walk look across the room, I have people here that I've shared. I know a big piece of myself. They've shared a big piece of their self with me. I, I, you know, I see Joe, I see Mike, everybody's been through a one year to live retreat. And I'm honored to be up here to help to represent you guys and to, to, to help push this, this retreat out uh, as far as we can get it so we can touch as many men, heal as many men as, as possible. But I wanna know, how many, how many guys here have not re attended a retreat? Can you just raise your hands for me? Okay. Now I want to make sure you notice you're in the minority. We want you to join the majority. So let me tell you a little bit about what, what when your liver treats are all about. I'm using a baseball analogy just because there's a couple of different things. We have a playbook, we have a playing field, we recruit, right? We have referees, we have scoring. <laughs> Doug's laughing, yeah. And when and then I'll wrap it up with some with some personal um, revel, revelations, I guess best way to put it. So basically our playbook is, is uh, we're on the second iteration of Lyman Coleman's One Year to Live that Doug referred to yesterday. That's uh, copyrighted 2012 by La Mancha. Um, that's an important piece we need to make, remember, guys, especially those of you who are retreat leaders. We need to make sure this information is in every piece of our literature from participants guides <laughs> to leadership guides that we have that information in there. This is Lyman's property. We are blessed to be able to use this. It works. And it works as is. We tweak it, but it works as, right? It works as is. It works, as Doug says, besides ourselves, right? In spite of us, In spite of us it works. Uh, it was been field tested. You see Doug's name, Dave Long out of Wisconsin, Jeff Fortenberry, who I was fortunate to meet in Ohio uh, just last month. It's made up of leaders' guides. Uh, leadership guide, a reunion guide, a, port, a participant portfolio, and then there's also a 12-week follow-up guide. And that's some of the things that we need to really look at as reunions. For those of you who have gone at leaderships in the past, uh, Lon and I are starting to push reunions, two-week, whatever, well, some of us will be two-year re reunions, as well as uh, forming a 12-week uh, follow-up. Uh, it's real intense. I know Mike and I have been through it in Omaha, um, but we probably have uh, and Ed's been through it a couple times. So if you want to talk to somebody about what that's like, you know, let us know. But that's an intense environment. You really get to know the man that you're saddled up next to. The playing field, anywhere God has moved men to reach out to other hurting men. And so far we've been in Cal uh, California, Colorado, South Carolina, North Carolina, Nebraska, Wisconsin, Minnesota, and Georgia. Did I miss any? Ohio. <laughs> I don't remember when I put this together. Maybe it was before Ohio. Okay, so we have active leadership, 
And by active leadership, I mean there's, there's folks that are putting on retreats that have done multiple retreats that have a leadership group that they, they, that they choose, not pick and choose from, wrong words, but that they recruit from to put retreats on. And there's in Colorado, Nebraska, South Carolina, Wisconsin, Minnesota, and Ohio. <laughs> Recruiting, one of the things we do, what we found, email doesn't work. Jim was saying that last night, email does not work. Email works for information, but it doesn't work to get the man's name on the, on the uh, piece of paper and sign them up. It just doesn't work. Flyers don't work. What does work, quite simply, is past participants going out and saying, Bernie, you need to come because you not believe the changes I've seen in my life because of that retreat. We've had a number of guys, um, our music group, full of men who I've been trying to recruit for two years to go. And I did get one of our guitarists to go, and we're sitting there at a bar after practice. Yes, we had a few drinks, and we're talking, and one of the, my guitarists, I'm trying to get these guys to come, and the guitarist says to me, he goes, guys, this is a mountaintop experience, but that's not what it's about. And this is a new Christian. He's having a new baby, needs, needs to get his life in order in his mind. His message was, it raised my bottom. Think about that for a minute. It raised my bottom. So when he goes up, which is when he plays, and he, and he praises God through his playing, he only comes down this far now. He doesn't come all the way to the bottom. And every time he's involved with us, and every time he, he gets involved, his bottom gets raised up again. I thought that was the coolest thing I'd ever heard somebody tell us about one year to live. So postcards, flyers, we use them, but we use them as a way of, of introducing uh, ourselves to that individual. So it'd be like, Dennis, here, I want you to know about one year to live retreat. I've been there, I'd like you to come. I think it'd be great if you were to come and maybe invite some of your buddies to come with. It's just an icebreaker. And then they've got something stuck in their pocket that's got your name on it, it's got the retreats, uh, when, when it's gonna happen and so forth. And then the other thing we found that pastoral endorsement is huge. It's like Tim was talking about yesterday, you know, the bishop being involved and the bishop wanting, uh, pushing it from that, his perspective or her perspective. We need that also. Because when we had our biggest turnouts in Nebraska, it's because our pastor was involved. He was preaching about it. He was very active in the men's ministry at that point in time. We don't have that now. So now that it's up to us, it's been a lot harder to recruit. And then probably the biggest thing from this year, and, and, I, and I have to lay this on, on Dennis here from uh, state, the great state of Nebraska. Um, Dennis does a lot of traveling for uh, the Senate, and so he sees a lot of pastors. So he's, we've put on Building Men for Christ workshops, and in our last one year live retreat of three weeks ago now, five of the 11 came from there, came from Building Men for Christ workshops. Three out of the South East cluster and no, two out of lot southeast and three out of the northeast cluster. So, and as we move out west, we expect to get more and more and more. So, so I make that tie-in. Referees, two platform leaders. They're model the protocols. It's their job to show the participants what it is we're expecting from them, and they set the stage by bringing what we call our A game. And our A game is sharing with the participants in the group who we are, what our story is, and why our story affected us, and hopefully how the story will affect you as a participant. Two small group leaders. This would be we break into a, a small group of anywhere from three to five with two small group leaders, an experienced leader, and a co-leader. Basically, it's their job to model for their group, create and maintain an absolutely safe environment. And that's also on the platform leaders and the leadership in general is to create that safe place. The biggest, the biggest thing that we offer a participant is the ability to create that cone of silence as Maxwell Smart would say, where you could say anything that's on your heart that needs to be said, that needs to be out on the table create that safe place. And that's what our goal with the small group 
That's our referees. So how do we score this? Well, since 2008, we've had 150 plus leaders involved. We've had 500 plus participants, 20, 21 states, because I'm assuming Ohio's probably not in there. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know, I'm a quick study. 19 participants is our average size. Uh, the largest retreat we've had is 34. We had that twice. And uh, once in Wisconsin, one in Nebraska. And then the smallest has been six. And I know that, again? Uh, no, we didn't do it from a participant perspective. But that's a good point. We have had, in, in Ken's deal, we've, we've had people from Louisiana, Alabama, Kentucky, Tennessee. Um, so we've almost hit probably a good 30 states with participants. That, that information in my database is very, very, very iffy. My wrap-up slide didn't make it. Okay. Let me wrap it up really quick. And I've had permission to share some of this stuff. This is um, a ministry, a calling that I know has greatly affected my life and my relationships with other men, with my family, and with my Lord. And I guess I want to share some of the things, some of the impact that the retreat has had on some of the guys that I've come in contact with. I was talking to Joe last night. We haven't seen each other since last October. And we were in a small group together. And Joe says, he shared a story with me. He says, you know, Steve, I, I left the retreat thinking, what did this do for me? What did this really do for me? Then he got home, went out to the fence, like we do every once in a while, talk to the neighbor, right? Started talking to the neighbor like, the neighbor started talking like he used to talk, he started talking to the neighbor, and, he, and all of a sudden he went, I can't talk like this anymore. This is not me. I left that behind. And we're, I'm not gonna go into specifics, but wow. Thanks for sharing that with me, Joe. You know, it's awesome. You know, I look, at, I look at Mike, who I've, a kid that I've slept in the same room with more often than, than my kids or my wife in the lately because we've been doing a lot of traveling. <laughs> Different beds. Too much information. Oh, sorry. I should show you the mask he has to wear. He does wear a CPAP, so, and I wear earplugs. So. But Mike, Mike, could you, since you're sucking on coffee, would you give me your mission statement? Sure, Steve. Um, I am Mike, a persistent and determined man of integrity, loving son, brother, father, grandfather, and friend. I exist to lead with courage, serve with compassion, and give hope to those who despair. I do this by accepting responsibility, rejecting passivity, and sharing my experience. Bless you. So one of the things that, the reason I asked Mike to share that quite quickly with you guys was lead with compassion. Lead, work, lead when called. Lead with courage. Mike, when Mike walked into the church, and I have permission to say this, but I'm on tape, so I better say it differently. <laughs> <laughs> So when I walked, what's that? He was trapping. He was trapping, yes. When Mike walked into the church, it was only because he was chasing a, a woman. Okay. There, I said it nicely, as nice as I could. And I guess, needless that he didn't know this, but he was the one being trapped, right? And he felt the need. He felt the call. You've all kind of heard some stories from yesterday. In ending, he's following his mission. He's now the president of Lutheran Men Mission in Nebraska. He held my post for two years ahead of this, what I'm doing for well, one year to live. He's led multiple retreats. He's been a small group leader, a leader on well over 12 different retreats uh, in the last uh, four years. So 
I guess what I'm trying to hear, my point I'm making here, guys, is what is your mission? Those of you who've been to the retreat, are you following your mission? I'm Steve, a committed, loving father, son, man of God. I exist to help those in healing the brokenness caused by our sinful nature. I do this by participating in men's ministry wherever, whenever, and however possible. And I'm in. We share a story. I got two stories, and I'm then I'm done. I promise you, I'm done. <laughs> the one story was a couple years ago. Mike was sitting. I'm sorry, it's all about Mike, you know. But we're sitting, and Mike's he's sitting down in a chair that he never sits in in the middle of the of the lobby at, at Bethany, and he says, "I looked at him, and I went, uh oh." And knowing Mike has heart problems, I walked up, Mike, how you doing? I've taken my first nitro. If I take the next one, we need to call a squad. Mike says, would you pray for me? And Barb, our director of uh, youth ministries, I said, yes, we'll do that. We took him back into his office, or her office, sat him down. Barb and I laid hands on him. I've never felt the Holy Spirit work through me before as I did that day. We prayed. Barb and I both experienced that. We talked about it to this day that the heat and the warmth that flowed from us into Mike, into Mike, was life-changing for me <laughs> and for Mike because <laughs> he ended up in the hospital but only to be checked out and released. The other thing, you want me to, oh. I'm not. The other thing that, that I want to share with, and then was this just this last Wednesday, our pastor came up to me in the service on Wednesday night and he said, Hey, a little girl's bleeding from the eye, exact words. Would you go back and, and make sure that, that she's okay and assess the situation and handle it for me? And I said, Sure. So I went back there, and she wasn't bleeding from the eye, she got hit with a, with a paddle ping pong paddle across the bridge of the nose and of course you know it flowered open and it bled like stuck pig so they were mopping the, the, the blood up off the floor when I walked in I went okay found the mom and for whatever reason for those of you who know me I'm very loud and brash and can be fairly intimidating all of a sudden my voice dropped into this I don't work come from voice and I'm talking to the lady and I can see the lady calming down I could see the, the little girl calming down and the, lady, the mom, who I've never known before, she was just a new visitor to our church, says to me, are you a doctor? And I said, no, I'm just from the church, and, I'm, and I'm, I'm here to care for you and make sure everything's okay. And I just see this big breath. So we get things calmed down, and the little girl still, she's really frightened and, and so forth. And mom's like, pissed, <laughs> best way to put it, right? Because now my kid's hurt, i got to find a hospital to take her to to get stitches and so forth. So I go to stand up thinking, okay, everything's done. I don't know why. I look back down at, her, at Mackenzie and I said, would you like me to pray for you? And Mackenzie says, yes. Didn't hesitate. She looked me in the eye and said, yes. I said, okay. So I sat down. I said, can I put my hand on your head? She says, yes. I put my hand on my head. I asked mom, prayed. Didn't pray a prayer that I would pray for guys. Right? One of these things, where does these words come from? I have no idea. I don't even, to this day, I can't remember what I said. But what I felt was Mackenzie accept the spirit to calm down. To just, again, that, <laughs> I know I had to look weird. And I had this audience around me who I didn't even know had, had, had come around me. All the other moms who were caring they they came around us and Mackenzie calms way down mom calmed way down I'm I'm like like this like a kid in a candy store because I got this huge smile on my face but what I felt was that peace that surpasses all understanding flowed from me by the spirit into Mackenzie 
I'd have never done that three years ago. I wouldn't even, I would have said, oh, you're okay. Go get a stitch or two and then, you know, send us the bill. I never would have done that. So guys, I encourage you, those of you who have not been part of One Year to Live, attend a retreat. It is life-changing. You have a, an internal, an eternal band of brothers to deal with. You know, we were talking about these crosses yesterday. Who, was, who recited all the, Ken did, recited every single piece of the cross except one in my mind. The Jerusalem cross has a lot of different crosses in it. And there's a lot of different versions. But in me, every cross re represents one of us, interconnected as brothers for eternity for each other and to do the work of Christ. Okay. Steve, could I just have uh, the guys who have attended a one year to live retreat please stand up. Okay. This isn't to show off or anything, but it's for the rest of us to know who we can talk to, visit about, or if you sit across the table, you know, ask about some of the experiences and and uh, things. We won't can't, okay, you guys have a seat. We won't go into too many details because we want the experience to be fresh and new for the first time you attend as well. But uh, So please understand that too. Next on our agenda, Rich White's going to share information about the Building Men for Christ workshops we've been doing. Turn it over to Rich. Thank you. Thanks, Lon. And I come here in mourning. It was a tough night last night. The best team did not win. The baseball season is over. Okay, so what can I say? So if I'm not energetic today, you'll know why. I'd like to speak about the Building Men for Christ workshop. Would you really like to? Boy, that's enthusiasm, man. It's one of these great things. Do you want me to take over? No, no, that's all right. That's all right. I, think, I, I, I think, you know, okay. okay. On behalf of all the guys, yeah, okay. thanks, thanks. there's always next year. Just ask the Cubs. Yeah, <laughs> thanks. Okay. With, with that vote of thanks and sincerity from you all helping me out, I think I'll be able to do this and talk about Building Men for Christ, which is a workshop that we have been doing for the last four years in response to requests from guys at churches for to answer the question, how do I get a men's ministry, a men's group, something going at my church? That is a question we had for years and years. People would say, we need help, we need help. So what we did is we kind of looked to see what was out there, to say, is there something out there that we can take advantage of? because we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We've come to the realization that is not necessary. And what we found is that Man in the Mirror has put to, had put together a, uh, a workshop, a 44-hour workshop, based on their book, No Man Left Behind. And so in the, uh, the fall of 2008, Tim, Doug, and I went to one in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Three Lutherans among 160 Baptists. Okay. But we experienced it and said, this is good stuff. There's a lot of good things here we can develop, we can work with. We talked with Man in the Mirror, can we pick up on this? We'd like to take advantage of this and use it. Tailor it a little bit for the Lutheran, you know, our, the Lutheran beliefs and traditions, but, but use the basic approach. And they said, absolutely, absolutely. As long as you give us attribution. So we did. So we've picked up on that and have continued with it and have been offering it. First time was in 2009. We've done it 15 times. We've reached over 300 guys with it and a few women. We've actually had a few women pastors attend, and it's been really, really good when they have. Um, and what we've done is we've, we've had it not in 20 states, but we've had it in 12 so far and looking to do more. And again, what's the purpose? It's to help men at a congregation get something going, get something started, or if they have something already, enhance it and add to it. And 
it's we've taken it down to eight hours. We had tried 12 hours, which was a Friday night and an all-day Saturday, and we found that didn't work. It was a real problem getting guys to commit to an overnight. And so I said, okay, we can work it a little more. Worked down, left a little of this out, got it down, so now we can do it in eight hours. And that seems to have been very successful by getting to that. It's a one-day event. Typically start at 8.30, end at 4, 4.30. Um, so it, it's easy to do. And what we're doing, we're focusing on, on uh, how to reach out to men in a congregation about developing relationships. Because what's men's ministry? Relationships. And that's what we're doing, trying to help them how to break down some of those barriers that are there and reach out to them. The key thing that I took from the, the, one, the event we went to the first time, the key thing that I took was that one size does not fit all. Now you may say that's obvious. And yes, it is, but to me at the time it wasn't. And basically what that says is you can't do one type of thing and expect that to hit every guy. There are different kinds of guys in every congregation, and Man in the Mirror has got it down to five different types of guys. And what you have to do is, is look at reaching out to the five different types of guys. And an example I'll have is if you have a guy who comes to church very infrequently, very infrequently, but you see him and you say, you decide, here's a guy we want to see if we can't make a connection with. And you say, Fred, we are going to do a six-week Bible study on the book of Leviticus, and you would love it. <laughs> what do you think your chances of success are? Yeah, probably not too high. But maybe if you said, Fred, a couple of us are getting together, We're going to watch a football game, have a Sam Adams or two, just kind of hang out together. Would you be interested? Hey, it might work. Or maybe we're going to a baseball game. Or we're going to work at a Habitat for Humanity project. Or we're going to build a handicap ramp, something like that. That may work. And that's really what it comes down to, these different things to reach out. And you need to look at it in that vein. And that's what the workshop talks about. And then it talks about the man in the mirror model, which is a conveyor belt a conveyor belt. And what you think of is getting a guy on one end of the conveyor belt and then moving him across the conveyor belt, continuously moving. And that's what they have in one end of the belt. If you look at their actual model or diagram, it's wide. It's very wide because you're reaching out to all these different types of guys. guys, but it's not deep. The other end, it's narrow, but it's very deep because you have pulled them out like a funnel and pull them along. The rate of the conveyor belt is up to the individual. It is up to the individual. Not everybody moves at the same rate. You may make a connection next week and not have another connection for a year. But then maybe after that it's six months and then three months. Another guy may connect with them next week. The following week something else works. So you don't know, and you have to respect that because that's the way it is. That's reality. So that's what this Man in the Mirror, uh, the uh, Building Men for Christ workshop is. It talks about that, the different types of guys. The conveyor belt moves along, offers a lot of practical examples. There's a lot of time in it for hands-on to sit down. There are a lot of worksheets to help guys lay things out, uh, templates. And so it's let's sit down and talk about this. So we'll discuss it as a concept and then have groups get together, work on it, and then come back. Let's share what you have come up with. And the idea here is develop an action plan. So at the end, there's the start of an action plan. There's something they can walk away with and work from there in that congregation. It's best for two to three guys from a congregation to come together because then they start to work together. That doesn't mean they have to. would love it that way. But single guys, that works too get some started, they can take it back. So it's a great eight-hour way to get, get things going. And we've had really, really, uh, really good, good success with it so far. Dennis uh, in Nebraska has picked up on, I was in Omaha in January. We had 45 <clears throat> men, I think a couple of women as I remember were there. And I did it, Dennis has picked up on it. You've done it three times since then. On his own. And that's our model. We'll get someone to your location to kind of put it on, we've got 
got it all laid out what needs to be done it's very easy to do get it started then hopefully someone there will pick up on it and then can lead it at other uh, congregations you know get groups of guys together to work together and that's what we have there's there's some really good materials from man in the mirror we have put together it's about a 60 page PowerPoint that has it all there that we gladly share so that's what building men for Christ is we're looking to partner with congregations to host it in their areas. Again, we'll get the person there that knows, that has been through it and is leader. We've got uh, a series of trained, a bunch of trained leaders in it. Lon's one, Doug, myself, Jim Monkman, Dennis does it, Fred Bowles, Tim has done it. So you can see we're, we're building this cadre of leaders, much in the same way of one year to live. And the one thing I'm working on doing is getting a person like Steve and Mike before him to be the overseer of, of, no man, of uh, building men for Christ you know, for Lutheran Men in Mission that will take care of that. And I'm talking to an individual that hopefully, knock on wood, will say, yes, I'll do it. So that's what it is. If you're interested, have any questions, contact me. Right now I'm kind of keeping track of it. We've got one next week, Jim, is it, and you're in Houston? Yeah, I'll be in Houston. I'm actually, it's, it's a man retreat for that Right. Two retreats. Exactly. In for the, uh, the Gulf Coast, uh, Gulf Coast, but. It's Gulf Coast Synod, yeah. Yeah, the Gulf Coast Synod. Two weeks, Lon's going to be in Ohio, West Alexandria, Ohio, I think it is, leading one there. West so. Alexander. Yeah, so we've, you can see we've got them, want to get them. I'm working on trying to get one into New England, one into New Jersey, uh, one into Metro DC where I am. So anyway, that's what Building Men for Christ is. Again, if you're interested, let us know and we'll make sure it happens. Right. Thanks guys. We're going to uh, move on to our next topic and that uh, I'm inviting Kyle Peterson and Keith Langford up. I'm gonna let them take the podium or however they've organized the presentation on Lutheran Man Mission's efforts with young men and the ministry and discipling of young men. All right, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Kyle Peterson. I am um, on part-time staff with, with Lutheran Men of Mission and based out of Des Moines, Iowa. And have the privilege of been hanging out with the organization uh, for a couple years. I think I, I was first introduced to Lutheran Men of Mission about um, late 2007 into 2008. Um, had heard um, of what they were doing at the congregational level. I'd worked in student ministry for a while and um, jumped over to the, the corporate side. Um, and it's really been around as kind of the, the um, one of the faces of the young men the last couple of years. Um, so continue kind of in the role of young men's uh, ministry specialist. Um, Keith Langford is based out of Denver, Colorado as well, actually Aurora, since I know we have some Coloradoans here, and really is serving as one of the members of the Young Men's Ministry Council. So he and I are gonna talk just for a few moments this morning about some of the resources that exist. Um, chose not to do slides this morning just to more engage you and kind of wet your whistle about going out to what's on the website and to show a couple of the resources up here this morning uh, four things I want to touch on young men and as we talk about the intergenerational ministry because it's not just ministry to young men because that makes it a kind of a youth group a oh hey let's go have the kids table over here rather it is going to be more intergenerational men's ministry um, touch on leadership development, resource development, and some of the stuff that's happening with social media. So, again, it's not just young men. Um, with the coming of age book, we do have, a, it's definitely inter intergenerational. The backstory of the young men, if you've been around for a while, has been to, oh, uh, probably early 2000s. There was a talk of how do we really work with maybe the organization now known as Vibrant Faith with the Youth and Family Institute with a couple uh, people who were uh, had the opportunity to do some research and we produced a resource called Coming of Age and I think it's over here on the resource table as well 
um, there is a, a, lot, a lot of research being done about faith formation in young men and exploring the identity and spirituality of, of young men. And while it's going on about 10 years old now, it's still uh, very crucial. And looking at the last, the, one of the appends is, or addendums is, or I guess it's an appendix. There's too, too many of those A words running around um, about the I go model. And really what we've realized with, with young men's ministries, it's not, as I mentioned a moment ago, not doing a, a young men's ministry, making it a youth group. It's going to be um, being involved in men's lives, not just doing programming for young men, but um, really coming alongside, walking alongside, and making that happen as well. And so the... Keith, can I, um, I'm, I'm going to maybe bug you for a moment and say, do you want to talk a little bit about the, the IGO model and some of your experiences the last couple of years with that? I mean, give us the overview of, of that since you know that fairly well as well. So see what we can do. So tag. Well, I really haven't had too much personal experience with the IGO model, but um, I know of others who have. Uh, Larry Moeller from California would be one who has had a lot of experience with that model of identify, invest, or identify, invite, and invest. And it's just a good way to build a relationship that doesn't come across as phony or, oh, I'm going to do this out of guilt. You know, um, we're kind of good at that. So it comes across as something much more authentic. You get to build a relationship and do ministry at the same time. So. And if you get a chance, take a look at, it's towards the end of the book, um, in the last uh, 10, 20 pages or so, um, on page 203, and just a three-step process on that uh, really forms the foundational core of a lot of activities, because everything can be based off of that. Um, what is LMM doing at the national level for young men and intergenerational ministry? We have the Young Men's Ministry Council. So it's not going to be really a separate um, programming board or anything else. It's kind of ideas from within the demographic. To have a, a group of young guys that rotate through who can be a sounding board as well as an idea generation pool for the main um, board of directors and the leadership of the national organization. And so it's really kind of real-time feedback to the Lutheran Men Mission Board and try to get them geographically dispersed. Uh, that way we've got guys from the Pacific Northwest, um, from the Southwest, from um, the Central States, as well as the, the regions in the Northeast and Southeast. Uh, just because of the way we as Lutherans are geographically dispersed, um, we tend to kind of hunker into the, um, the marked territories that Lutherans are already in. And so we, I, I think we, we try to keep a oh, about eight to ten guys in, in pocket that we have as resources that can, based on seasons of life, um, being available for resources around here and there. And so I think we've got uh, some opportunities as guys have moved on with some life stages right now for younger men, kind of that post-college to pre-minivan mindset and demographic to be a part of the Young Men's Council. We've got a couple guys that are based out of the um, – the Denver area, uh, guys that are based out of the uh, western Kansas area, um, people that are in Indiana and Minneapolis and kind of the Des Moines area as well, and talking to a couple other uh, gentlemen that are from the East Coast as well. And so we really want to have them be resources in your neck of the woods. But it's more than just being on, sitting on a board, being a resource at the national level, it's about leadership development and really stop talking about it and just do it. Uh, there's a lot of young men out there um, who want to do something, but they're not quite sure, how do I do that? And we've really developed about two and a half years ago something called LEAD. Uh, it's not really an acronym for anything, just a, a, a non-conjugated verb of really bringing in a group of young guys who are the right spiritual DNA and really walking them through a 12-month program, um, doing it kind of as a test kitchen at the national level walking through a couple generations, and then being able to say, go and do likewise. Not really saying, okay, now we're going to form you into the next little um, 
Lutheran men and mission robots. Rather, it's going to be more of go do where God's prompting you to do in your local context. And that's the cool thing about that. Um, and so as we've tweaked the model and worked with that a little bit, um, we are just about ready to start our third iteration of that at the national level. But we want, we're going to be publishing the, the model and the uh, materials that we use to be used at the local level. So let me grab a couple of those resources. In that, 12 month, in that 12 month context that we use, we, um, we do monthly conference calls um, and, and have some kind of, kind of homework. In, in some ways, it's a certificate program to say, you know, when we get done with this 12 months, we'll have walked from A through Z and really hear some of the takeaways that you have in your toolkit. And really taking a look at the, the study of where young men are at. Um, Michael Kimmel has a book called Guyland. It's a, not a faith-based book, it's just a snapshot from about three years ago that looks at young men, uh, the young men's culture, and indicating what that is. And so we say, here's who we're in and amongst. What about the, the church context, unchristian? We walk through this resource or parts of it. And this is a Barna book, um, and uh, David Kinnaman and Gabe Lyons really talking about the stereotypes and the uphill battle that the church is facing. And so we start to develop, OK, we know who's our, who's our constituency, some of the existing forces that work, and then we start to help them paradigm shift their, potentially, their DNA. Another book called Revolution by another Barna book, talking about what is happening, what is the grassroots efforts that are happening from within right now that are outside of the established organizations. And we utilize, not fully, but we utilize bits and pieces of other resources, such as Organic Church by Neil Cole. Uh, they're heavily into the house church movement, but to have to be aware of some of the forces that are at work, we look at some of what they're talked about on there to realize what's happening and help them identify spiritual gifts and go through that route as well. Um, so where do we sit? How do we make this applicable for takeaways for you guys at the national level versus just doing something in kind of an ivory tower uh, in Chicago or in the Midwest? Really designing some um, kind of white papers and best practices to be able to push out and say, here's what's going on, um, here's best practices that you can take away and hand out to a lot of the people in your organization to say, here's where we can, here's what's happening, here's what's working around the country, and really some best pra practices there. Um, the goal is to start aggregating a lot of material that's out there of saying, here is, um, here's some great resources. They may not all be um, Lutheran badged or published by um, a Minnesota or Chicago-based publishing house, but they're, God's using them to impact some young men. And it's, it's kind of exciting to be able to say, here's some good resources there. And really doing, um, trying to be a, a wellspring of some social media opportunities as well. Working with the, the Twitter, the Google+, Facebook pages, and definitely available, a couple of us on Young Men's Council are available to uh, do some trainings on social media as you guys are up for that to help impact uh, the young men in your congregation. And I think that we'll be talking more in a few minutes um, later this morning about the Faith Formation 2020 model and some of the resources there. So um, really there's a lot going on, um, but it, it's tough to really condense it to a a five-minute commercial this morning about this, but take a look at the uh, the website and have the conversations with me at break and with Keith, and we can let you know who the the young men's ministry members or council members are in your neck of the woods. Um, so with that, um, let us know, and we can make that happen. So, Lon, anything else I can deep dive into for the moment? Earlier this morning, you got a chance to uh, sample a little bit of the Master Builders Bible for Men. Uh, Bernie's going to share a little bit more about what's in there with you guys. And uh, turn it over to Bernie. Morning once again, guys. Um, I gotta admit, <clears throat> just in the last few weeks, I actually uh, got into these first 32 pages of our Bible. 
because I had the original Bible I have is the one that has some of you have seen that has a green uh, master builder on the front instead of the blue one that was one of our earlier editions that we put out one of the first ones and we at that point hadn't included this um, this segment in the Bible and my everyday use is I use that original Bible I have and it's pretty well broke down and uh, in fact I took this Bible to try to copy the Bible study uh, on the copy machine and I couldn't get it flat enough to get a, a copy so I had to go home and get my old beat up one that the backs all broke down on and was able to use it so so I had to sit down and read through uh, a lot of the information that's in the front of the Bible you know we we not only want to have the scripture there in front of it we decided that it was, uh, it was a great opportunity to put in this supplement that would uh, talk about uh, the men's ministry and how to uh, go about forming one in your congregation and if, I don't know how many of you have your Bible with you but it uh, it just has a lot of uh, different um, things in there talking about the leadership how to build relationships step by step special events team meetings there's questions there to ask with your pastor or in the church staff, you know, if you can get them on base with you, if you can sit down and go through this with the pastor ahead of time and get their blessing, it's going to make it a lot easier on you to get the ministry going in your congregation. I've, I've run across so many churches that, you know, there's guys interested in it, but for some reason, if the pastor doesn't give their blessing, um, it'll never fly. And I think one of the things that I've... Uh, I continue to say to the people when I go out there and talk to churches about how to do this, you know, you got to you, you got to remind the pastor that this isn't something that we want the pastor to do. All we are asking of the pastor is their blessing. They don't need any more Bible study groups to lead or whatever it might be, you know, head up the ball team or whatever. They, but if they give you that blessing and and occasionally can come and participate in. Uh, in one of your meetings or your Bible studies, that's great, but it's not something that you're expecting them to do all the time. They have enough. Um, I, uh, president of a congregation, I see how much information comes just for myself as president, and uh, I usually pick up the mail a lot of times during the week and, you know, stacks of stuff that they have to go through that's kind of mind boggling sometimes, so they don't need this. but. If you, uh, if you go through there, you have uh, there's just one under special events. Men retreats can become an annual event to which the men in your congregation look forward to. Um, a meal with a respected Christian athlete, a businessman or leader sharing with why his faith is important to him. Uh, sometimes we think that uh, just because they're done well in business, that that's all that their life's about. But if you can reach out to that one particular person that has done well and yet is still a committed Christian and can come and give a little testimony or something to your group. It's, it makes all the difference in the world. It's, uh, it, it just goes along with everything we've talked about, you know, with the one year to live, the building men for Christ, the relationships, um, a barbecue, a father-child dinner, bike trip, camp out, um, those different kind of things to include not just the men but the family my own congregation our men sponsor a, uh, a family um, tour someplace we've gone to a big sawmill we've gone to an Oregon uh, company where they build organs and uh, just a number of different places where you could take the whole family maybe on a we try to do it on a Sunday afternoon but you can't always get into some of the businesses on a Sunday but then try to make it where there's you know we have a chance to go eat together and, and do stuff. So um, there's always ways of including uh, ministry along with fun. Fun doesn't need to be, or ministry just doesn't need to be boring. Uh, so uh, there's, there's kind of ways to sneak it in. I say the back door <laughs> with some guys, you know, 
So as, as you go through the, the book, there's, you know, there's things there, questions you can answer. You can write down, uh, you know, uh, what you need here on, uh, uh, there's a, you can write a group covenant, like the purpose of our group is, we'll be studying, the materials we'll use, things like that. So you can, uh, you know, you can have a step-by-step -step program. There again, it can be as structured as you want it or as loose as you want it. But uh, one thing I know when you, uh, when you do this and you, if you do get a group together and you have a specific time to meet, and I meet with a group, one of the ones in our synod that has a Saturday morning breakfast on the first Saturday in the morning. They start at 7 o'clock, 8.15, it's done. They, have, they all order breakfast at this restaurant, and then they do their Bible study, a little bit of business meeting, just uh, talk about a few things, items that's uh, happening in their area. And then they do their Bible study. And at 8.15, it doesn't matter whether they're done, the Bible study. That's when the meeting's adjourned. If you want to stay longer, you can and discuss things, but you got to have a start and stop time. If you're taking guys' time out of their busy day, especially on a Saturday, and they have they don't want to be there till 12 o'clock, sitting in a in a Bible study or a, a men's breakfast when they have other things to do. So you give them that opportunity. Here it is, 45 minutes. Boom, we're out of there. If you want to stick around longer and, and discuss the topic we're on, fine, but. You gotta make sure be, you know, respectful of a man's time. And then as you go through, just you know, just list all the different kind of uh, uh, events that are in there that you can use ideas. You don't have the Bible. Well, how many have the Bible now? I would say, I'd be surprised if not everybody in this group, because you've been involved in enough of our activities now that. If you didn't buy one, you got one at one of our events that we, we give out. But, uh, and then we also have this Spanish, Hispanic New Testament. And Doug, do you know how many we have left of these? Uh, a little over a thousand. Little, a little over a thousand. And last year we uh, made the decision that if there's, to try to give these to all the, our Hispanic missions that are starting out there, which are, are just cropping up all over the United States. Uh, we offered it to them how many they wanted. Uh, I think Doug said somebody was taking some someplace this weekend, or you didn't get them for them. Well, we sent 500 to one church that's going to South America, and 100 from uh, about 50 from my church that's going to Peru. Yeah, so, and this started out, was the first ones we took to, down to, uh, I'm trying to think who went down there to Guyana, wasn't it? Oh, Guyana. Yeah. No. We didn't have them. Okay. But um, we've made them available to take into the, those other countries that speak Spanish. I've, I've uh, distributed some in my own synod where we have a couple uh, Hispanic uh, congregations. Oh. I think that's about it, guys.